Today, we ask the question, who is Jesus? It's a fairly straightforward question, right? Grace, who is Jesus? He's God's son. But see, we know this now, but when Jesus was living on earth, it was a lot bigger question. People were still trying to figure out just who Jesus is. And one day, Jesus, being all sneaky-like, kind of like a teenager a little bit, like, you know, so think back. Think back to junior high. And remember, you know, how many times did you nudge your friends and be like, hey, hey, think that girl likes me? Or boy, as the case may be. But I mean, how many of us did that, right? We ask our friends, so what, a, what, a, what does someone else think of me? What are people saying? Do people like me? Am I friendly? Am I nice? Don't pick on me. Oh, wait, that was just my junior high school experience. <laughs> so Jesus asks his disciples, what are people saying about me? There's a lot under this question because if you remember to last week's gospel, it was one of the things that Mark already tells us. He tells us that people have been talking about Jesus, saying that he is John the Baptist raised from the dead, or one of the prophets, or Elijah come back. And this is what the disciples are passing along to Jesus. Oh, yeah, this is the stuff that we've been hearing. But how many times do we think, do we ever think about what other people, people who don't go to church, think Jesus is? Have you ever asked someone who isn't a Christian who they think Jesus is? You get some interesting answers. I've heard from a lot of people that they like this Jesus guy. He's a good teacher. He's got a lot of good things to say. You can take or leave followers, but they like Jesus. So he's a teacher. Teaches good things. Tells us how to be nice to people. Some people might even spot you that he did some miracles. It's not likely these days. But interestingly enough, when you read critiques of Jesus from Jesus' time, no one really denies that he did miracles. That was fine. It was the whole claiming to be the Son of God bit that they all had issue with. Now, to some other folk, Jesus is a great prophet. He is, to many, even the Messiah. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he's anything but a person, a regular, plain old human. He just did some neat stuff. To some other folk, he is another incarnation of their God. Just their God showed up one day and looking like Jesus and did some teaching, and then he went off and showed up somewhere else as somebody else and did some more teaching. If you ask a group of people who Jesus is, you'll probably get that many answers as you have people in the group. So that's who people say Jesus is. But then Jesus asks the more important question of his disciples. Who do you say that I am? He flips the question around. His disciples could, at this point could have given any number of answers. They could have agreed that he was a prophet. They could have agreed that he was a teacher. But then Peter stands up and gives a very particular answer. A very specific answer with a whole lot of meaning behind it. And he gives an answer that in Matthew's gospel, Matthew says that it could only be revealed to him by the Father in heaven. And Peter quite simply answers, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. Sometimes we miss some of the underlying things behind that statement. When Peter says to Jesus, you are the Christ, he had a very specific picture in mind. Looking back after Paul's letters and 2,000 years of Christian teaching, we miss what that picture probably was. 
See, for first century Jews, the Messiah was a king. Specifically, a king descended from David who would restore David's throne to Israel. He would bring together all of the nations to Jerusalem to worship God and end evil and tyranny, which to first century Jews, they had a very specific evil and tyranny that they wanted ended, the Roman occupiers. Israel itself would be restored then through, under the Messiah's rule to the glory of David and Solomon, and the Spirit of God would be on all people. Now it's interesting that Peter would call Jesus the Messiah because he wasn't the only person that people were talking about being the Messiah. During Jesus' life, which for the sake of argument, let's just call from 4 BC to 30 AD, because it makes the math easy, there were three Messiahs that we know for sure about. Simon of Perea, Athrogenes, and Judas of Galilee. And then Acts chapter 5 tells us of another, a guy named Thutis who had 400 followers. All of these folk, the only thing they had in common was that they all claimed that they were the Messiah. And of course, they claimed that they're under their rule, Rome would be kicked out and Israel would be restored to their full, former glory and so on and so forth. So when Peter calls Jesus the Messiah, that's probably the kind of Messiah that he was thinking about. A Messiah that's going to roll in, kick out the Romans, and set up an Israel, set up Israel as a kingdom again and be great and awesome and wonderful and perfect forever. And then Jesus starts talking crazy. Because Jesus grabs his disciples and starts to teach them that the Son of Man has to be betrayed and then turned over to the chief priests and the elders and the teachers of the law, and he's going to die and then rise again after three days. And this is too much for Peter. Peter just can't take it at this point because he's going, no, no, no. His whole worldview is crashing down around him. Everything he thought the Messiah would be, Jesus is saying the opposite. So it's a small wonder that he turns around, takes Jesus aside and says, no, Jesus, you can't, you're not, no, no. Peter didn't get what Jesus meant by being the Messiah. And then, after about a week, with Peter and the other disciples still stewing on this, Jesus grabs Peter, James, and John, and they go climb a mountain. Okay, that's kind of weird, but we'll go with it. They go up on top of the mountain, and as they're on top of the mountain, Jesus turns shiny, Moses shows up, Elijah shows up, and Peter is scared out of his already addled wits. Now, what's interesting the gospel says that Moses, Jesus, and Elijah were talking. Mark doesn't say what they were talking about. Matthew doesn't say what they were talking about. Luke says what they were talking about. It's kind of cute. It's one little sentence. They start talking about Jesus' exodus, which was about to happen in Jerusalem. That's a big word, exodus. Isn't that a book of the Bible? I think that's a book of the Bible. Now, what happened in the book of Exodus? You remember? There's Moses, slavery, Pharaoh, plagues, Passover, not slavery, Red Sea, idiots. Let's be fair. By the time you get any of the bit into the book of Exodus, Let's be fair, whenever you get any bit of into the whole Bible, you will eventually look at them and go, idiots. But it's interesting that Jesus, the word that they use to talk about what's going to happen in Jerusalem is Exodus. And the most important event of the Exodus has to be the Passover. The time when God's people killed a perfect lamb, 
and then marked the doorposts of their house with its blood so that the angel of death would pass them over. Jesus is already setting up what he's going to do in this conversation with Moses and Elijah. He too will be sacrificed, not just to save his people from the angel of death, not to save his people from Rome, but to save his people from sin and from death. That's what makes it so appropriate that we celebrate the transfiguration at this time of year. That we celebrate the, trans- the transfiguration as we make the transition from the season of Epiphany, where Jesus appears to the world, to the season of Lent. When we, with Jesus, turn our attention towards the cross. When we turn our attention to our sin and the reason that Jesus goes to the cross. Because we know who Jesus is. We've been talking about who Jesus is through the book of, or through the season of Epiphany. The Gospel of Mark up to this point has been talking about who Jesus is. But now it's something different. Now the focus is not on who Jesus is, but it's on what he's going to do. As we go into the season of Lent and we sit and remember that we are sinners. On Wednesday, we'll hear the somewhat soul-crushing words, remember that you are dust, and to dust you will return. Because it reminds us of all those things, why Jesus is going to the cross. And so now, as we make this transition with Jesus and his disciples, we can say with confidence that we know who Jesus is, that he is the Messiah. And through the 40 days of Lent, we can walk with Jesus to the cross. We can feel the same pain of the disciples on Good Friday. But we can also celebrate with the disciples the joyous Easter that we know is coming. The salvation of God's people from sin and death, when Jesus truly did what the Messiah came to do to save God's people, to eliminate the power of death, to forgive our sins once and for all so that we can be raised with him to new life because that is who Jesus is. That's the Jesus we see at the transfiguration and the Jesus that welcomes us every day.